Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series, we're ready for lesson three, is entitled, God's Mission, My Mission. And this lesson is entitled, God's Call to Mission. It's a lesson for October 21 of 2023. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we consider the possibility of going to work with you at our side, the Holy Spirit guiding us. May we reach out to those around us and make effective witnesses is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever felt that God was trying to move, out, move you out of your comfort zone? There are many stories in Scripture and from the history of the Christian church in which God has had to move people out of their comfort zones. Think of the story of the Tower of Babel. That would be an obvious one, right? Jim? Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. At first, the people of the whole world had only one language and used the same words. As they wandered about in the east, they came to the plain of Babylon <clears throat> and settled there and said to an uh, excuse me, and said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them hard, so that they had bricks to build with and tar to hold them together. They said, Now, let's build a city with a tower that reaches to the sky, so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over all the earth. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which those men had built, and said, Now then, these are all the one people and are speak one language. This is just the beginning of what they are going to do. Soon they will be able to do anything they want. Let us go down and mix up their language so that they will not understand one another. So the Lord scattered them all over the earth and they stopped building the city. The city was called Babylon. And because there the Lord mixed up the language of all the people and from that and from there, he scattered them over all the earth from the American Bible City, Holy Bible, Good News Translation. Okay, now, <clears throat> if we go back and know, re look at the review of the, review of the story earlier, God had told them that that's what they were supposed to do, scatter out, replenish the earth, fill it up, and so forth, and these people had decided that's not what they wanted to do. <clears throat> um, we have some people who are kind of rebellious like that today. Carrie? Yeah. Uh, from the writings of Ellen G. White, this dispersion was the means of peopling the earth, and thus the Lord's purpose was accomplished through the very means that men had employed to prevent its fulfillment. That's from Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, 120, paragraph 1. Okay. Keep Jennifer, going. go ahead. Oh, okay. From the Bible study guide, uh, this story of the people at the Tower of Babel reveals their great ambition. They were planning to make a monumental structure, a city and a tower such as existed nowhere else in the world. A tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. And that was from Genesis 11.4. What's that, the new version, so I can't remember. NIV. Yeah. NIV, new international version. Yeah. How often today do people seek to do the same, whether through politics, art, business, even religion, it doesn't matter. There are those who want to make a great name for themselves. In the end, how futile and meaningless their endeavors are. This is from... Uh, I can't read Bible that. study guide, the, yeah, uh, it was the adult Bible study. There, it threw me out. Well, think about what happened a while later. What about the story of Abraham? He lived among an apostate and idolatrous family and nation. God called him to go to a country to which he had never been. Jennifer? In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home and go to a land that I am going to show you. I will give you many descendants and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless all the nations. Okay, let's stop there for just a second. In what way has God blessed all the nations through him? One very obvious way. Well, through his descendants, the Bible came. Yeah, they produced the Bible, exactly. Okay, go ahead. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land until he came to the sacred tree of Morah, the holy place at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were still living in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, this is the country that I am going to give to your descendants. I'm gonna interrupt one more time. Do you think he went around to all the people there and said, uh, guess what? God has said this land belongs to me. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> doing something like that. Anyway, go ahead. Then Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, he moved on south to the hill country east of the city of Bethel and set up his camp between Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There also he built an altar and worshiped the Lord. Then he moved on from place to place, going towards the southern part of Canaan from the Good News Bible. Okay. Abraham was the first known foreign missionary, and he was, very, he was a very effective one. Dwayne? God called Abraham to be a teacher of his word. He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household in the principles of God's law. And that which gave power to Abraham's teaching was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, many of them heads of families, and not a few, but newly converted from heathenism. Does that sound like a good situation? Okay, go ahead. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. No weak, vacillating methods would suffice. Of Abraham, God said, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. Genesis 18, 19. Yet his authority was exercised with such wisdom and tenderness that hearts were one. The testimony of the divine watcher is, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. From Ellen White, the book Education. Now, have you ever tried to figure out how that would work? We know that at one time he had he employed 318 soldiers just to protect the herdsmen who are keeping his flocks. So, I mean, how did he's a, do you, how do you exert your authority in a situation like that? Did he just have a bunch of these soldiers, for example, sort of his henchmen that sort of not only protected them, but they made sure nobody else was, I mean, and obviously he had his skills. What happened when the marauders came in from the east and conquered, you know, captured Lot and his family? We'll get to that in a little bit later, but Abraham went out and, you know, we don't know exactly how effective he was as a, as a soldier himself, but God sure blessed him and he, you know, his group of relatively few people beat, Two or three kings, five, four or five kings. Amazing. Okay. Myra? From the Bible study guide. God asked Abram whose name he later whose name he later changed to Abraham to leave his country and his people and go to another land. It was all part of God's plan to use Abraham as a vehicle to fulfill his divine purposes in the earth. And Abraham went according to the word of the Lord. If God has a plan for you, it may be a call for you to leave your extended family and your people and go to a place where he's opening up for you to serve him in order that you might be a blessing to others from the Bible study guide. Now I can tell you, my wife would tell you many stories uh, <clears throat> between my family, which which is relatively small compared to her family, which is large. Someone calculated when we have spent something like 160 years in mission service. Most of it in India, quite a bit of it in Africa, 
uh, and she remembers as a child, her cousins would come home, and those were the days when you, you said goodbye to your family and you never knew for sure whether you'd ever come back. Uh, you went for a seven-year term. It was, um, yeah. I, we, my wife and I, when we first left for Africa, we figured we would be there the rest of our lives. That, that was what we thought. So think about Abraham. Bye, mom and dad, bye. Well, I guess he took his dad and his mom with him. But uh, other friends, no. we're, never, we're never coming back. Most of us will not need to, tra to leave our homes and travel to distant countries. There are plenty of mission fields right around us. Hebrews 11, 9, by faith he, that is Abram or Abraham, lived as a foreigner in the country that God had promised him. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who received the same promise from God. Good news, Bible. And if you follow down through the book of Genesis, you will see that that exact promise was made to each one of them. Well, <clears throat> we know that on some occasions, God communicated with Abraham directly. Can you think of an example? Before he uh, destroyed Sodom, he yeah. had direct communication face to face. There he was. Along with two angels. Exactly. Can you think of some time that he communicated with Abraham in a vision? Do you remember the time he cut animals in half and passed through and God he saw this boiling, this, this burning pot went right there? And you wonder what? I mean, as a child, I wonder what in the world was that all about? And it turns out that's the way they sealed contracts back in the days and in the territory where Abraham came from. And the reason for cutting the animals in half was, the idea was if you break this contract, this is what's gonna happen to you. Mm. <laughs> that, the, you know, I guess it's a graphic way of putting it, right? We need to remember that Abraham did not have a pastor. He did not have a Bible, not even a tiny piece of Bible. He did not have a Sabbath school class or a prophet to direct him. But he did have numerous relations with God directly through vision and through personal interaction, including visions of personal visits. Did the devil visit him also? I'm sure he did. Did he visit him claiming to be God? Would God allow that, you think? I mean, we, we need to think about these, <laughs> when we look at these Bible stories. Okay, Abraham had greatly desired to see, look, just look at this, this is amazing. Abraham, had, this is from Ellen White, Abraham had greatly desired to see the promised Savior, because he had been promised, you know, it's gonna come in your line. Um, he offered up the most earnest prayer that before his death he might behold the Messiah, and he saw Christ. A supernatural light was given him, and he acknowledged Christ, Christ's divine character. He uh, saw his day and was glad. He was given a view of the divine sacrifice for, uh, for sin. Of this sacrifice, he had an illustration in his own experience. The command came to him, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him for a burnt offering. Remember the story of Genesis 22. Upon the altar of sacrifice, he laid the son of promise, the son in whom his hopes were centered. <clears throat> then as he waited beside the altar with knife upraised to obey God, he heard a voice from heaven saying, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Now how many people, how many human beings saw that interaction? None that we know of. None. There was nobody else up there. He, he left the two, his two servants back behind there, remember? Just the two of them were there. So what was the purpose of this whole interaction? For the onlooking universe. For the onlooking universe, exactly. But, you know, they might have wondered why, why did God pick out this guy? Well, let me show you. This guy's special. But wasn't it also for Abraham as well? Well, yeah. Absolutely, no argument about that. Well, we already sort of implied that. So, um, this terrible ordeal was imposed upon Abraham that he might see the day of Christ and realize the great love of God for the world. 
so great that to raise it from his degradation, he gave his only begotten son to a most shameful death. Abraham learned of God the greatest lesson ever given to mortals. His prayer that he might see Christ before he should die was answered. He saw Christ, he saw all that mortal can see and live. By making an entire surrender, he was able to understand the vision of Christ which had been given him. He was shown that in giving his only begotten son to save sinners from eternal ruin, God was making a greater and more wonderful sacrifice than ever man could make. From Ellen White, Desire of Ages 468 and 469. So how would you support that, which, what I just read to you, how would you support that from the Bible? We're getting a little rusty, huh? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember Jesus' discussion with the Sanhedrin? Let's look at this. Um, what chapter are you looking? We're looking at John 8, and I'm going to go back, I'm going to start with verse. They, they had accused him of having a demon. Yeah, I have no demon, Jesus answered. I honor my father, but you dishonor me. I am not seeking honor for myself, but there is one who is seeking it and who judges in my favor. I am telling you the truth. Whoever obeys my teaching will never die. They said to him, now, now we are certain that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets died, yet you say that whoever obeys you and your teaching will never die? Our father Abraham died. You, you do not claim to be greater than Abraham, do you? And the prophets also died. Who do you think you are? Jesus answered, if I were to honor myself, that, that honor would be worth nothing. The one who honors me is my father, with the capital father there. The very one you say is your God. You have never known me, you have never known him, but I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and I obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see the time of my coming. He saw it and was glad. Mm. She had Jesus' own words to support that. They said to him, you're not even 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? I'm telling you the truth, Jesus replied, before Abraham was born, I am. That's a very interesting situation. You know that the word I am in Hebrew is Yahweh, the name for God. And so he had already said that twice earlier. If you go back to verse 24 and so forth, Jesus said that twice and they sort of didn't catch it. This time he said it in a way you couldn't possibly miss that he was saying, I am God, I am the Messiah. And of course, what did they do? Pick up stones. Pick up rocks to stone him. Yeah. Okay. You might feel uncomfortable going beyond your comfort zone, but think of Abraham going to a land full of pagan people known for their violence. Did he feel safe? Did he worry every night that he, might, he was going to be attacked and destroyed? Well, he had 318 soldiers. I guess <laughs> maybe that was some kind of protection. Abraham did, however, have the promise of God that the land was going to be given to his descendants. I wonder how many people knew that message. Um, and jo Genesis 12, which we already read, Jennifer read to us. Things did not go smoothly for Abraham in his early years in Palestine. Fortunately, God was able to turn Abraham's deceit into an ultimate blessing for his descendants. And this is something that not many people know, but let's look at this. Did Abraham think that God was going to take him to a land flowing with milk and honey? What do we know about this land later? It was known as the land of milk and honey. It was not long before there was a famine in Canaan, and Abraham had to move further south and finally go all the way to Egypt to live tempor temporarily. Now, the question I have when I read this story always is, okay, did he go down to Egypt with his 318 soldiers and his thousands of people who are, you know, in his university and all his sheep and... I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of this story. It wouldn't have done much good for just he and Sarah to have gone down. Everyone else would have to eat also during that yep. famine. Yep, exactly. While Abraham was there, of course we're talking about Egypt now, People told Pharaoh about how beautiful Abraham's, quote, sister was. And was, was Sarah his sister? 
it? Half sister. Uh, half sister. Same father, different mothers. Okay, and so Pharaoh, so Pharaoh took her, took. He sent his people out there to take her, and brought her into his harem. Then he discovered that she was Abraham's wife. But Pharaoh recognized that Abraham was a powerful man. I mean, look at the look at the people that he had with him. He had some connections to powers, and you know, what happened when he took Pharaoh, took Sarah to to his into his harem? I don't know how long he was there, but what do we? What does the Bible say? Birth control. None of the women could get pregnant. How long do you have to be there before before <laughs> you discovered that? Yeah. I wonder if all the ones that were pregnant when Sarah went there had spontaneous abortions. That's another possibility. Doesn't say that, but. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Pharaoh realized that there, this guy is not some not an ordinary person. There's something special about him. So he sent Abraham out of the country with blessings and gifts. But Pharaoh also made a law that Egyptians should not closely associate with people who herd animals. Jim? From Ellen White, during his stay in Egypt, Abraham gave evidence that he was not free from human weakness and imperfection. In concealing the fact that Sarah was his wife, he betrayed a trust of the divine care a lack of that lofty faith and courage so often and nobly exemplified in his life. Through Abraham's lack of faith, Sarah was placed in a great peril, in great peril. The king of Egypt, being informed of her beauty, caused her to be taken to his palace, intending to make her his wife. But the Lord, in his great mercy, protected Sarah by sending judgments upon the royal household. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 130. Okay, now, ladies, how old was Sarah when he did this? Mm -hmm. wow. Getting up there. She was probably at least 70. Of course, people lived longer in those days, but... Can people be beautiful at age 70? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> The laws passed by the Egyptians, here's what's really important. The laws passed by the Egyptians, again associating with, uh, against associating with shepherds, served as a protection for the children of Israel many years later when they immigrated to Egypt because of another famine. They were forced to live, in, to live separately from the Egyptians. Instead of just melting into Egyptian society, they developed into a separate nation. Amazing. Carrie? Uh, from BSG, another element of the call to Abraham that is overlooked is found in Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3. Abraham was called to bless the nations. We are called to do the same. We often fail to note that the nations also would bless Abraham. This is from Genesis 12, 3a. God's call to mission always implies a two-way blessing. Those who follow God must be prepared to receive a blessing from the broader world around them as well. The call to mission is always a call to bless and be blessed. Understanding this dynamic changes the call, call rather, persons or persons, attitude toward others and changes one approach to sharing the good news, we will explore this theme more in the next lesson. When we read scripture, a noticeable trend flows throughout both testaments. The trend is that God had to remind humanity periodically of the original call in Genesis. The need for a reminder resulted from two things. One, often God's followers forgot the what God called them to do, and two changing times required reinforcements of their calling. That is, the overall point to God's call needs to be cont this is textualized, yes, from time to time, but the call itself remains essentially the same. That's from Adult Teachers Summer School Bible Study Guide. Yeah, so it needs to be updated once in a while. The way we would reach out to try to spread the gospel today isn't the same as people did a hundred years ago. Not, 
not mentioned a thousand years ago. They didn't use television and the they internet? Didn't. They didn't. Social media? <laughs> no, nothing like that. Uh, yeah. so, so, to what group or groups do you think God wants you to reach out? If you read through those various passages, you learn several things. Obviously, part of what you learn is that God is able to predict the future. He predicted in detail the coming and mission of Christ. It is very clear from these passages that God has the ability to predict the future, even far in advance. Clearly, he predicted a number, uh, predicted a number of the details of the life and mission of Jesus hundreds of years in advance. He understands human nature and knows how each one of us is going to live our lives. Coming down to New Testament times, we have other examples. Following the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his followers were first completely disheartened, but then began to share the truth after the 40 days with Jesus after his ascension to heaven. Jesus had told them that they were to spread the good news in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. But they were very comfortable in Jerusalem and continued spreading the good news there. Okay. Jennifer? Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. After the stoning of Stephen, Saul approved of his murder. That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers, except the apostles, were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men buried Stephen, mourning for him with loud cries. But Saul tried to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged out the believers, both men and women, and threw them into jail. The believers who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the message from the Good News Bible. Okay. <clears throat> Our Bible study guide points out, until this time, the early church was mainly in Jerusalem or within the Jewish territory and among the Jewish people. When persecution began, in which Saul, a devout Jew and a Pharisee at that time, was actively involved, the church in Jerusalem was then dispersed all over Judea and Samaria. Jesus had predicted in Acts 1-8 that you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, in IV. This statement was fulfilled, as noted in Acts 8, 4, that those who have had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Even after the church began to move out beyond Jerusalem, the believers were still preaching only in the regions of the Jews or in the neighborhoods of the Jewish people in other cities. Okay, here's another little quiz question for you. Jew, the Jews scattered all over the Mediterranean world, and they that scattered bunch of Jews were called what? Do you remember? The diaspora. The diaspora, exactly. Acts 11, 19 indicates that the believers were dispersed all the way to Phoenicia, which is currently Lebanon, and Cyprus, and we're going to find out even more than that. But they did not at this stage preach the message to anyone other than the Jews alone. So there were Jews all over the place, scattered doing business all through that area. So when they went there, of course, they were First thing they did is preach to other Jews. The disciples of Jesus and the early church did not intend to see the Gentiles, uh, but only Jews, come to the Lord. They still had very narrow views of what, on what the mission of the church was to be from our Bible study guide for Wednesday. And Acts 11, 19, 26 will tell us what happened next. Something very interesting. Duane? Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution, which took place when Stephen was killed, went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message to the Jews only. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene... Okay, now I'm going to interrupt for a second. Where is Cyprus? In the Mediterranean. Mediterranean. Yeah. It's a pretty good-sized island in the Mediterranean. the Mediterranean. Yeah. And where is Cyrene? It's Libya. Libya. So here's people coming from Libya and the island of Cyprus. And what do they do? Preaching to the Gentiles. Okay, go ahead, Duane. Uh, they, they were from Cyprus and Cyrene. They went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. 
The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The news about this reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And I'm going to interrupt again for a second. They sent him to Antioch to do what? What are they doing, letting Gentiles yeah. into the church? <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid that's what the plan was. Anyway, go ahead. When he arrived and saw how God had blessed the people, he was glad and urged them all to be faithful and true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Now it turns out that Antioch and Tarsus are not very far apart. And I don't know how he, how he figured out that Paul was over in Tarsus, but he went over there and said, hey, you come help us. When he found him, he took him to Antioch, and for a whole year, the two met with the people of the church and taught a large group. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Okay, so why do you suppose they were first called Christians there? There are several possible reasons. Can you think of one? Well, one just very simple one is that probably most of the Gentiles just considered them to be a, a subset of Jews, just some of the Jews with some other ideas. That, what other reasons could, were they called Christians, do you think? Well, it was a disparaging term, wasn't it? Followers of that oh, dead man. Yeah. yeah, followers of that dead man, probably. We do not even know the names of that, those first evangelists who started spreading the gospel to Gentiles. After spending years with Jesus, why do you think it was so hard for the disciples to feel comfortable reaching out to Gentiles as he did? Are childhood prejudices really hard to overcome? Hmm. Can <laughs> be. There's a challenge, huh? Peter was rebuked by Paul for his prejudice even after that fantastic experience with Cornelius and his family. And you remember there in Acts 10 and up to 11, Peter was down there at Joppa doing some work down there, but he was, he was called and he went on up to reach the people at Cornelius and family and friends. And what happened to them? The Holy Spirit came on them just as it did on us at Pentecost, is what Peter said, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Peter just, he knew, he knew it wasn't going to be friendly when he went back to Jerusalem, so he took six witnesses with him to confirm that God had indeed poured out his Spirit on Gentiles. You mean God poured his Spirit out on Gentiles? No. Impossible. Impossible. How could it be? The disciples and the stepbrothers of Jesus were so prejudiced against Gentiles that when Paul traveled back to Jerusalem, bringing some Gentiles with him, those church leaders failed to stand up for Paul when he was accused before the Jewish leaders. And you can read about that in Ellen White's book, Acts of the Apostles, 400 to 405. Amazing. Amazing. These, are the, these are the Christian church leaders. Having spent time with Jesus himself, one might think that the disciples were uh, would not make many of the mistakes made in the early church. In fact, what we read is that even the disciples thought their homes were in, though their homes were in Galilee, felt comfortable staying in Jerusalem because that is where the other disciples were and other Christians lived. Just because they were disciples doesn't mean they were perfect. What? Oh, come on. <laughs> but yeah, they're they the ones... They are the ones that Jesus chose to be the founders of the Christian church. I mean, they weren't saints. I've seen pictures of them in lots of churches with halos over them. Yep. We have the whole group of Israelites. They were God's people, too. <laughs> okay. Finally, the point came when God had to take at least Peter, one of the church leaders, away from Jerusalem and send him directly to a Gentile foreigner. And here we'll, do, we'll read just a few verses of this. Acts 10, verses 9 to 15 and 28 and 29. The next day as they were on their way and coming near Joppa, Peter went up on the roof of the house about noon in order to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. While the food was being prepared, he had a vision. He saw heaven opened 
and something coming down that looked like a large sheet being lowered by its four corners to the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals, reptiles and wild birds. The voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Certainly not, Lord. I have never eaten anything ritually unclean or defiled. The voice spoke to him again. Do not consider anything unclean that God has declared clean. He said to them... We skip down a few verses because it yes. repeats. Uh, in verse 28, he said to them, You yourselves know very well that a Jew is not allowed by his religion to visit or associate with Gentiles. But God has shown me that I must not consider any person ritually unclean or defiled. And so when you sent, sent for me, I came without objection. I ask you then, why did you send for me? Now remember, in those days, the Jews, when they came from the marketplace and bought vegetables and fruits and so forth, they would go home and go through an elaborate cleansing process just in case some of those fruits and vegetables had been touched by a Gentile. <laughs> so rem just, just remind yourself of the context here. The question, how was it, verse 28, how did uh, God has, verse God has shown me that I must not consider any person richly unclean or defiled. My interpretation of that is that the sheet with all the unclean animals we, came down that way. Yeah. Other people interpret that quite different, but yeah. in, in the context, I don't see how it can be no, any that's, different from This is obviously the situation. Yeah. Some people think that's saying these foods are, you yeah. can eat these things, these reptiles and so yeah. on. Let us remind ourselves of the directions that God gave to the early church fathers at the very beginning, immediately after Christ had ascended. Acts 1.8, But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, from the Good News Bible. Okay, go, you go ahead and read the Bible from, Study Guide there. The Bible Study Guide. First, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, as we have seen, but it is worth repeating, we are, in, we are to be his witnesses in the place where we physically reside. This may, be, may include our own homes, our church, our neighborhood, and our community. We need to be his witnesses first where we are, in the area he has initially placed us, home or work, and to be his witnesses to the people closest to us. It may be close family or extended family, church Indeed. people, work colleagues, neighbors, and the community. That's implying that God has put us where we are. So mm -hmm. has God put us here? That's what it seems to say. Or have we put ourselves here? Sometimes people are interested only in going off to a far country and alien culture to be God's witnesses. But they do not witness to people around them now. We should begin where we are and move from there as the Lord leads us. Next, do you have a comment? Well, I was just going to say, it go on to the next stage. I mean, I, I've just thought of my experience working overseas and the other, my relatives and my wife's relatives who worked overseas. It's, a, it's an eye-opening experience to work in other cultures. Myra and I moved to another culture yeah. for a few years, too. Mm -hmm. It's called New Orleans. Yes. It's very different. Oh, wow. It was very different, and people where I worked watched me very closely because I was vegetarian. They did not understand yeah. what that meant. Well, what do you eat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Must be some strange. What, what I remember about New Orleans is we were traveling to our New Orleans on our way to my father was drafted in the military, going from San, going from uh, San Antonio to Massachusetts. And we, we, ran, we hit New Orleans on the Sabbath. So, of course, we found, had to find an Adventist church. We found an Adventist church, and mostly it was uh, colored folks, but we had a nice church. And after one, they said, well, would you like us to show you around a little bit? Sure, well, we've never been to New Orleans. They, they drove us around, and what was amazing to us, we'd come from northern Idaho, okay? 
was amazing to us. They showed us this park just completely, because that territory is just flat as can be, and I don't know if it's still there or not, but they had someone had piled up the dirt about 50 or 60 feet tall, quite a big mound, and at this bottom there's a sign that said, this is a hill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my brother and I just, with our mouths hanging open, what? This is a mountain. <laughs> when we were there, we, we looked at the clouds that every afternoon you had a thunderstorm yeah. and the clouds were our mountains yeah. because it is very flat there, very flat. Very, very flat. Mm. Okay. Next, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, Acts 1.8. Again, Jesus affirms the reality that witnessing involves crossing cultural boundaries. They're there in New Orleans too. Mm -hmm. Beginning from where we are, we may be called to move to other areas to reach out to different social, ethnic and religious groups. If I belong to a certain ethnic or language people group, it may be much easier for me to witness to them because of minimal culture, cultural barriers to cross. In some areas of the world, only one clan or tribe is represented in the makeup of the church. However, Jesus' great commission tells us that as his witnesses, moving out of our comfort zone and investing our resources for such people groups is crucial. They also need the message of Jesus. I think of some major parts of the world where almost nobody knows any, I mean, most of the people know nothing at all about real Christianity. Most, there are many areas where they don't even know of any Christianity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the challenge in the Bible study guide, identify and make a list of people groups with special needs in your community whom the church has not made efforts to reach. And challenge up, begin praying for an opportunity in the near future to become engaged in mission to people with special needs from the Bible study guide for Thursday. Okay, so every Thursday during this quarter, we're gonna get challenges. We're gonna say, if you wanna go out and witness, you wanna make a difference in the world around you, try doing some of these things. And that's one example there. This is the principle set out by Jesus that shows us how we need to act as his disciples who have the good news to share with others. Sharing the truth is not about convincing others how wrong they are, although sometimes that seems to be the approach, uh, but rather about sharing Jesus as portrayed in the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. And we have a very familiar passage here. And I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to, to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, honor or, well, and praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed the first one saying, she has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast and its image and receives the mark of their forehead, or receives a mark on their forehead or on their hand, will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full length, strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the lamb. The smoke of the, tor of the fire that torments, torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast and its image for anyone who has the mark of its name. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Well, so we all should be scared to death, right? That's the good news. Those verses that you just read. That's what it says, isn't it? Wow. So what is the message to us, Jim? Male and white. Before ascending to heaven, Jesus gave his disciples their commission. He told them that they were to be executors of the will in which he bequeathed to the world the treasures of eternal life. You have been witnesses of my life of sacrifice in behalf of the world, he said to them. You have seen my labors for Israel, and through my people, and, and all of my people, would not come to me as they, that they might have life, although priests 
and rulers have done unto me as they listed, although they have rejected me, they shall have still another opportunity of accepting the Son of God. You have seen that all, excuse me, you, you have seen that all who come to me to confession of their sins, I freely receive. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. To you, my disciples, I commit this message of mercy. It is to be given to both Jews and Gentiles, to the Israel first, and then to the nations, to all the nations, tongues and people, all who believe are to be gathered unto into one church. Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, page 27. So we, we sort of think, oh yeah, that sounds right. It just seemed you know, to us. But this must have been a totally, I mean, in a place where, you know, your neighbor might, you might be at war with your neighbor, you know, and on this side and on that side. And I mean, and all these little, each little group with his own things that's going on there for you to say, okay, now we're, we're going to get people from all these different places and we're going to put them together in a church and we're going to call each other brothers and sisters and we're going to act like a family. Huh? I mean, this wasn't an obvious, obvious thing. The Great Commission of Jesus, recorded in Matthew 28, 19, 28, 19, is clear. It is about going to others, especially other nations. Carrie? This is from EGW. The Gospel Commission is the great missionary charter of Christ's kingdom. The disciples were to work earnestly for souls giving to all the invitation of mercy. They were not to wait for the people to come to them, they were to go to the people with their message. And that's from Mrs. E.G. White, Acts of the Apostles 28.1. Now it's interesting, if you look at the context of that, the original plan with the children of Israel was to have them located in the crossroads of the world. And people were supposed to come to them but now, when he's coming to Christianity, what, he's, what is he saying? Just the opposite. He says, we're not going to have like a Christian spot in the world where everybody has to come and find their Christianity by coming there. No, he says, go out and spread your Christianity everywhere. Okay. Jennifer, you want to take the next one there? Sure. From Ellen G. White. There are in our world many who are nearer the kingdom of God than we suppose. In this dark world of sin, the Lord has many precious jewels, to whom he will guide his messengers. Everywhere there are those who will take their stand for Christ. Many will prize the wisdom of God above any earthly advantage and will become faithful light bearers. Convinced that Peter's course was in direct fulfillment of the plan of God, and that their prejudices and exclusiveness were utterly contrary to the spirit of the gospel, they glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Wow. Consider and discuss these questions raised in the Bible study guide. They're, they're, they're trying to really put the, you know, the burden to each one of us. One, how would you define the word mission as applied to you? How you apply it to your own life? Two, in what ways could you daily express mission in your attitude and behavior? How can you be more mission-minded in your daily tasks? And three, how important is it that we examine our hearts and seek power from above to be purged from prejudice against those unlike us? From our Bible study guide for Friday. Boy, we're supposed to get rid of all our prejudices, and then we're supposed to reach out to people that are not like us. Is that easy? Well, it says we're not to do it our, by ourselves. Good. Mm -hmm. Are we brave enough to take these questions seriously for ourselves? In our first two lessons, we focused on the fact that this mission was, was and is originally God's mission. It needs to be our mission as well. God has been waiting for 2,000 years for us to comprehend and implement His mission God has repeatedly promised his close followers that he would bless them, even multiply them to the generations. And there's a bunch of texts there, just, just through Genesis, not counting all the other places. 
God's original plan was for us to be fruitful and multiply and live in the Garden of Eden and spread that Garden of Eden eventually all, all around the earth, I'm sure. However, sin has created a lot of problems and God has had to work around it in many ways. Duane, I think that's yours. Sin, however, ushered in the necessity of a salvific plan that would make it possible for humanity to be able to fully live the life God intended. Redemption was demonstrated to humanity through the ritual of sacrifice. As Adam and Eve shared this plan with succeeding generations, they included the sacrificial act as part of revealing the scope of what God would do to rescue fallen humans. While many probably struggled to grasp how redemption would work, some could see that God had a plan that brought hope. This plan would become part of the call of God for humanity to share with the world. God's plan would make it possible for humans to live the reality He originally intended for them in Eden. Okay, so our lesson is going to emphasize this point that what did God say to Adam and Eve in the very right at the beginning? Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So now he's applying that same kind of idea to the gospel. You know, we can be fruitful and multiply, yes, but the purpose of being fruitful and multiply is to do what? Fill the earth, fill the earth with the truth, the God's truth, right? Mm -hmm. The plan of salvation or healing had to demonstrate the terrible truth that sin results in death and that we must turn away from sin in order to be a part of God's plan for our lives. One of the things that we don't often think about, but we need to think about more, is that God cannot take a bunch of sinners to heaven, the great controversy who would just start all over again. It's not like, you know, he, he, he just, I like you, I don't like you. No, he's, he's going to take everybody to heaven that is safe to live next door to. Okay. Had the, Another way to say that is he's going to take everyone who really wants to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, be, and, and there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the people who don't, the, the blatant sinners at least, they wouldn't be happy at all. Evan is self-selected. Yeah. Um, has sin and its results on this planet destroyed God's original plan? Or does God have a way of putting things back together, eliminating sin and sinners, and making this earth future headquarters like the Garden of Eden again? And if you want to read exactly how that takes place, the final steps of it actually happening, the Book of Great Controversy by Ellen White, pages 662 to 674. It's an amazing, amazing um, several pages there. It is a challenge to read down through the history of the Old Testament and see and understand the different ways God sought to teach humans about the plan of salvation. All of the different efforts that He made in so many different ways. Wow. Um, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. We just mentioned it, but let's just read it again. This was God's original plan. Then God said, and now we will make human beings. They will be like us. So that's the first step, right? They will be like us and resemble us. They will have power over the fish, the birds, and all animals, domestic and wild, large and small. So God created human beings, making them be like himself. He created the male and female, blessed them, and said, have many children so that your descendants will live all over the earth and bring it under their control. I am putting you in charge of the fish, the birds, and all the wild animals. So that was God's original plan. And he hasn't given up on his original plan. He doesn't plan to. Okay. We will make human beings, they will be like us and resemble us. What do you suppose those two passages mean? They will be like us? Is that talking about behavior, beliefs, all that kind of stuff, and resemble us? Does that mean they'll have, God has a face and a nose and eyes and ears and, probably, we don't know that for sure. We, we all have the ability to choose and mm -hmm. God certainly had that choice too. Yeah. 
It is very clear that God intended for Abraham and his descendants to be a blessing to the entire world. But the call to Abraham would suggest that as we reach out to others and bless them with the good news, we will receive a blessing in return. Think about God's plan for the children of Israel as he went to such incredible lengths to get them out of the land of Egypt and establish them in the crossroads of the world. Solomon's prayer made it very clear that at least some of them understood God's plan. 1 Kings 8, verses 41 to 43. When a foreigner who lives in a distant land... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mara, I'm going to interrupt here for just a second. I know we're about out of time, but... When they dedicated that temple, I'm sure there are people from all the surrounding nations, even kings and people like that, who came, and they're listening to Solomon's prayer. So think about this. Go ahead. When a foreigner who lives in a... When a foreigner who lives in a distant land hears of your fame, and of the great things you have done for your people, and comes to worship you and to pray in this temple. Listen to his prayer in heaven where you live. Hear him and do what he asks you to do, so that all the peoples of the world may know that you, and know you and obey you as your people Israel do. Uh oh, I hope uh, it's not like that. <laughs> Then they will know that this temple I have built and it, in it, that I have built is the place where you are to be worshipped. Good well, news Bible. Probably in the days of Solomon, they were probably as close to that as they ever got. And then, Gordon? Isaiah 19, 23 to 25. When that time comes, there will be a highway between Egypt and Assyria. The people of those two countries will travel to and fro between them and the two nations will worship together instead of fighting, is what it means. Yes. When that time comes, Israel will rank with Egypt and Assyria, and these three nations will be a blessing to all the world. The Lord Almighty will bless them and say, I will bless you, Egypt, my people, you Assyria, whom I created, and you Israel, my chosen people. Wow. And we'll have bright time to read just a little bit of Micah 4, and their, they, their people will say, let us go up the hill to the Lord, to the temple of Israel's God. He will teach us what he wants us to do. We will walk in the paths he has chosen. And we'll stop there. That was God's plan, bringing everybody together. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we're praying that these lessons will be taken to heart by everybody who reads them and studies them, that your church of today will arise and finish the work so that we need not delay in this world of sin any longer. Forgive us where we have failed. Help us to do our part is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.